Hello and welcome to One Take. I'm Dale Kirshner. Today I'm talking with Carrie Rehm, President and CEO of Rehm Family Companies, a fourth generation family owned and operated business focused on providing exceptional service in the heavy duty truck industry. Carrie became the company's CEO unexpectedly about 10 years ago, when it was then only one location and known as uh, basically Rehm Kenworth. Today, Rehm Family Companies has 21 locations, employs more than 350 people, and has not only Rehm Kenworth, which is the second oldest continually operated Kenworth truck dealer in the world, but it also has RMC Truck Parts, a genuine and aftermarket parts sales company, Rehm Leasing, a truck rental and leasing company, and Rehm Global Sales, which handles international truck and parts sales and service training. Carrie, welcome to One Take. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. Thanks for being here. And let's start with the future. Uh, what are you planning for 2021? We've had uh, certainly a, a year full of unexpected uh, turns and events, but we have some uncertainties in front of us, at least for the next six months in 2021. So how are you planning and, and what do you see in the future? Well, uh, it's an interesting question because we learned last year that the best laid plans can be disrupted uh, totally from uh, from out of left field and not having nothing to do with your own decisions. Um, planning for 2021, we've been looking a lot at uh, industry forecasts and current uh, reports, and we're actually forecasting a really great 2021. Um, we believe that there are going to be uh, more truck sales, uh, definitely an uptick from, from 2020. Uh, we think it will be good for business uh, or for ser our service business as well as our parts business. So we are really, really looking forward to that. Uh, despite the fact that uh, we are still in uh, unpredictable times, uh, I think that the entire country has seen how important the trucking industry is to our overall economy. And we have felt fortunate that we're uh, an essential business and we're able to continue to operate. Uh, you know, some of the things that we don't know is, you know, when, when will restaurants reopen because the food is delivered on refrigerated trucks? Uh, when will the schools reopen because School uh, lunches are delivered on trucks. Milk is delivered on trucks. Um, so on and so forth. So there are so many aspects uh, of the, the overall economy that have been closed or, or minimized uh, in 2021 that we don't know how things will be. We don't know um, necessarily how soon or, or how this will impact um, housing starts, et cetera. But boy, it sure seems like this year people have been fixing their houses. Uh, I don't know if you do any um, DYI projects, but I hear from other people who do that you go to the, um, the Home Depot or wherever you get your supplies and they're out. So it yeah. should be really interesting. Yeah, I was finishing a DIY, a do-it-yourself project when COVID hit. And um, so I was, I was happy to be able to wrap it up. Um, you know, at, at first it gave me a, a reason to get out. I could go to the hardware store and, and still feel like I had a life. <laughs> but um, yeah, right now it's pretty bad. Well, that's really interesting though about 2021 that you're seeing a good year in front of you. Um, is there the chance that as the economy kind of comes back in all those sectors and you know things like restaurants and, and schools come back online, are you gonna have a hard time keeping up with demand? Well, uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully that won't be the case. Uh, last year we were impacted when the truck factories were shut down uh, for five or six weeks and then restarting. And then uh, I, the forecast for this year as uh, the overall, um, for all, all truck manufacturers was lower than, than 2019 by um, probably 15, 20% of a build. And throughout the year, since about mid-year, that expectation of the total build of commercial trucks has increased every month. So we know that there, that there is an increase. We think that it may level off about um, the beginning of third quarter, uh, but it, um, it, it, again, it looks like a good year. And the expectation is that there will be 
continued construction projects. Um, hopefully we will get a, an infrastructure bill passed in Washington. Uh, in Minnesota, there was a there was a roads and bridges bill that was passed uh, this past year that will will help us locally here. And the other thing that is um, true about Minnesota and and this region is that we have a diverse economy. Uh, we have a lot of ports, a lot of things come and go on on ships either through the river or through uh, the Great Lakes in our in our um, immediate region. So those things are good. Agriculture. Uh, obviously is, is good. Manufacturing is strong in Minnesota. So there, there are a lot, of, um, a lot of aspects of our overall state economy that, are, that is positive, even you know, logging up north. Uh, yep. Tell folks a little bit about how you, uh, what your experience was with used trucks in 2020 also. Uh, oh, well. Pendulum changed. The, it absolutely did. There was a swing. We started the year with a lot of trucks uh, second that were secondhand used in our used truck department. And as the um, factories were closed and people couldn't, trucking companies couldn't get a hold of, of new trucks um, at the pace that they wanted them, they turned to looking at the used market and our flood of used trucks that we had diminished. And by September, we were kind of running out of trucks. So used trucks. So it's been, that's one part of our business that is very volatile and uh, is somewhat predictable in that it'll follow that there'll be a after a peak year, about four or five years later, then you've got your peak of used trucks coming back in uh, for trades. So it was somewhat predictable, but last year was uh, incredibly um, difficult for the used truck market. But it's coming back, and the reports that I read is that almost every month uh, the prices are are increasing. So it's it's, it's it's a challenge. It's a balancing act, and there's so many little levers and and mm -hmm. valves to push uh, when you're. Um, when you're trying to operate that part of the business, which is less predictable. That makes me wonder, it, it seems like you had to shift a little bit back and forth uh, in, in more than one way during 2020. Uh, have you always been that nimble as a company or did you have to become more nimble, more flexible um, to be able to handle how things kind of went back and forth in different areas during 2020? Uh, 2020? Well, I, I wish I could answer that question with total confidence. I mean, we're always looking at, you know, the different aspects of the different um, profit centers in our business and what is likely to bloom or bust, so to speak. But I've been at this 10 years. This is the first time there's been any serious um, uh, economic uh, downturn. And it was so rapid. I mean, when you look at what mm -hmm. happened, it went straight down and then bounce, started to bounce back. Um, so I haven't been through one of these before. This has been one of the biggest um, challenges for me since I've been uh, the owner of this company and, and sitting in the CEO spot. Uh, the, you know, the previous, this business has been around since 1932. They were born out of the depression. Mm -hmm. So the company has had to be nimble, uh, but we sure learned a lot in a short period of time. Yeah. And, we, and had to, had to make decisions that would be good for the company long term, but would definitely impact um, some of our employees and some of our customers. Uh, for instance, um, cutting back on hours of operation um, impacted both our employees and our customers. Uh, trucks run 24 seven and when they need to be fixed, they need to be fixed. So, uh, that that definitely had an impact and we've tried to figure out how to how to accommodate people and and um and meet their needs despite that you also had to mix in the whole covid uh safety protocol situation oh absolutely you know, when it comes to people bringing their trucks in for for repairs and and just uh you know making sure your employees were taking the right steps from safety perspectives what were some of your challenges on that front and how did you solve those well we had uh weekly meetings to begin with and almost daily. I mean, when, when it 
first started happening, we would all gather in our um, boardroom and, and listen to Governor Walls tell us what was happening next. And then they, as we started to figure out how to deal with this, we also communicated constantly with a group of other um, Kenworth truck dealers so that we could share information and, and talk about what the implications were gonna be and how we were gonna handle it and, and shared all kinds of um, great ideas that helped everyone. Um, so it was a time to really um, give and get, I guess is the way I would put it, from a, a, a group of peers that, that are there to support you no matter what, but in particular at this time. Um, the, the other thing that we did was we just started right away um, thinking about how are we going to keep people safer. And we have um, administrative offices in the upper second floor of our of our building, and we cut it off, and which was really hard because I liked being visited by people that worked in other parts of the business. But we we cut it off because we we had the security, the ability to do that. We we strongly urged it in other locations that didn't have the same kind of ability to literally lock people out. Um, we did that with the various areas and said you just you need to work in your own area mm -hmm. you, and you just, just to, so people know you have a, a parts uh store downstairs and you also have a repair facility correct right right so we did things to try to stop people from mm -hmm. wandering back and forth between the two but also that's our sales location so yeah. we didn't want people moving into that location either uh, but then the customers come in well we started out with a lengthy questionnaire so that we could do contact tracing. And we really had to dial that back because it was cumbersome and there were some visitors who didn't wanna provide us with certain types of information. And so we just started tracking who came and when they left and, and what part of you know the store that they, they went into. Um, that, that, that's, it's so artificial at first, it's so hard. Now I think it's more second nature. But we also had concern about our, um, our technicians getting into a truck that they were going to have to work on and would they, would they possibly contract COVID that way. So being a, a glass half full kind of company and, and group, uh, we sourced a product that we could use to um, sanitize the truck and said, you know, at first there were some people, no, I don't want you spraying anything in my truck. I don't know what it is. Uh, we gave people the option, we will do this, or we will just, you know, we will fog your whole truck, or we will sanitize the, the main touch points. And that gave them the opportunity to, um, to make a choice instead of just telling them, this is what we are going to do. Um, but that product is something that we developed into kind of a group of products that were um, helpful to protect people. We, we stock masks, we have um, sanitizing gel available, we have this, um, this other product that we call Ream Clean. It is uh, someone else's product, so it's, it's co-branded, but we sell the accessories for dispersing it, et cetera. So we kind of made a, uh, a decision to find, find something new mm -hmm. to, to do uh, in the midst of this. Yep. And Carrie, talking about all this, I've, I've heard from some other CEOs where it's been a bit challenging, whether it's with clients or employees uh, to sometimes, especially earlier on, say you need to wear a mask when you're around us, or you need to let us sanitize your truck. And some people probably would rather go somewhere else or not have you work on their truck. Um, but and, I, and I'm sure that happened a couple of times. <laughs> How did you deal with that though? Did you have any of that kind of situation, whether it's with the masks or, or with the trucks? Oh yes. And you know, quite, quite frankly, it still happens from time to time. Um, I have had to say to employees, that mask isn't doing any good. I see your nose you know, pull it up over your nose or uh, stopping people that I see in the parking lot um, doubled up in vehicles saying, you need to wear your mask and one of you needs to sit in the back seat, preferably not the driver. You know, it's um, uh, something that, yes, people have different beliefs about COVID. Um, I would like to continue to be healthy. I want to be able to see my mom 
who is 88 years old and in hospice. And if I get sick, I can't see her. Uh, one of the things that we're doing is, is enlisting our managers who we consider to be leaders in a, in a uh, social media campaign called, Who Are You Wearing a Mask For? And I just told you why I wear a mask. And we were getting a lot of um, participation from people who um, give their reason why they're wearing a mask. It's so that their family can remain well. Uh, we had one person say it's because um, it, it, she was wearing her mask to honor the people who had lost their jobs because of COVID or become ill. You know, it, it's interesting when people have to dig deep and, and say why. Mm -hmm. and no one has said because Governor Walls told me to. There yeah. are personal reasons. And, uh, you know, it's to take care of one another, really. You know, just that brings up talent in general, um, you know, protecting talents. Um, and I also wanted to ask you, how were you affected by the situation with the unrest uh, in Minneapolis this year uh, with, you know, the, the horrible death that we all saw on video? Um, and what it meant for race relations. And you have a lot of diversity um, within the, the folks that uh, you work with throughout the state. So how did all that affect you? And, and did you have to make any changes here or there as a result? Well, I would say that personally, um, it impacted me because I thought that I lived in a state that was very welcoming and that, um, enjoyed its uh, immigrant communities. That's what I thought. And when I heard that Minnesota is one of the most racist states in the nation, I was shocked. And I thought, what do, what do I believe? And it, it caused some soul searching, but also just some researching. Why are people saying that, that the state is, is um, so, um, uh, discriminatory and I started to learn a little bit more about what it, what um, institutional racism means and and how it's been employed in our state and it, it's shocking uh, I I have been very open with with our employees um, after that happened and, and asking people also to do some soul searching themselves and I hope that they have um, from it we have, it's very plain that, that there is a, a particular group of immigrants who have seen the trucking industry as an, a real opportunity. Uh, there are a lot of Somali drivers out there, but I'm sure there are also some Somali truck, trucking company owners or burgeoning anyway. Um, and I want them to feel comfortable. And I have um, our HR department engaged in figuring out how to reach that group, uh, that particular immigrant group to bring in as employees, because gosh, I like going shopping where people look like me, wouldn't everybody? Um, or to be able to speak the same language. So we're working on that. Um, we of course have to um, submit our um, EEO uh, paperwork every year. And you know, we're not doing too bad. So I feel good about that. <clears throat> the trucking industry is male, white male dominated. And I don't see any reason why it can't be integrated. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I just had a conversation with our HR group. <clears throat> Yesterday I met with um, some folks at the Senna Foundation and learned about their programs and there is something that we can do to bring some of the young people in to see what happens at a trucking uh, a truck dealership so that they can be exposed to the, um, the possibility of, of careers at a, at a company like this or in this industry. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm kind of dry. Um, so just looking for opportunities, you don't have to look very far. Did you find, um, in terms of, you know, the personal um, introspection and also just as you talked about some of the other folks thinking about race relations, did you find any examples of hidden bias, uh, yes. either with yourself or with others? And, and if so, what were they? Well, in, for myself, 
I know that over time, sometimes I have felt um, not confident walking around certain places. I, I think that is just because that is what your, um, what is it, your, what part of the, your brain is it that is just your, your primal brain? Yeah, just kind of preconditioned. Yeah, it's just, it's, it's something that, that you see something, someone that's different and uh, how is that interaction going to be? So you, you, you pull back, but really, if you just say hello, you're going to find out pretty quickly. So <clears throat> I think that we do. It's just, it's just part, part of how we grew up. My daughter said to me, mom, I don't think I know any black people. I said, well, I do. You do too. You just don't think of that. We didn't live in a neighborhood where there was a lot of integration, but she had a lot of kids in her school who were not white people. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm going to take a sip of water. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah, I know it's, it's, um, it's very interesting. We've talked with some other folks uh, on the subject, of course, and it's just, uh, you mentioned how we all had a perception of Minnesota. Um, <clears throat> that we thought, sure, there were problems, but it's still overall a great place. Mm -hmm. But there uh, were a lot of um, underlying issues that we really saw come forward. Not as, as pretty as people would have liked, but at least we saw them and now we can deal with them. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think that's, that's part of it. And just um, bringing in some, uh, some diversity training into our company, um, speaking out, uh, when I have heard of people that I employ making remarks that are unacceptable, I have called them out on it. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I, and I, I do that because as a leader, I want other people to see that they can stop that kind of conversation as well. well yep. Yeah. I think, um, I also wanted to ask, how are you doing with retention? Um, you know, everybody seems to have different needs for talent. Um, we hear there are a lot of people who are unemployed, mm -hmm. and yet we still hear that people are having a, a little bit of a challenge finding or retaining people. How are you doing on the talent front? Well, we're always hiring. We are, before COVID, there was um, a, a deficit of, of uh, technicians. I mean, th it's, in, it's a job that people don't do anymore. They, they just don't aren't oriented that way, I guess. I don't know. I think high schools don't encourage vocations. They encourage college degrees. Mm -hmm. And that when that happens for over a long time, um, schools lose their funding because the programs aren't, don't have enough uh, students in them. So we already knew that there was um, a, a lack of talent. So we, um, we are always looking. We, um, encourage people to come forward with their ideas so that they know they're valued. Uh, I think that some of that helps. It's been really hard for me not to be able to go walk through our shops and say hello to people and ask them how their kids are, etc. And I think that um, just the general um, impact of COVID on everyone in every industry is impacting our employees too because I think they miss that that touch or that touch point with ownership. Yeah, we think it's hard to hire right now because it's like, yeah, hi, I'm I'm going to go work for a Zoom person, you know? Yeah, exactly. I mean that that has been. But what's interesting is that I can think of at least two technicians who left us this year mm -hmm. and came back already. Mm -hmm. Why? So, why? Um, I think that, you know, when people are just generally not feeling the love anymore, they're going to look to see if the grass is greener on the other side. And I think that they come to realize that Reem is a great place to work. Well, that's good. That's nice yeah. to hear. Yeah. Um, what would you say uh, is your greatest remaining challenge uh, that you either weren't able to quite tackle yet for 2020 or you see it in 2021, but what is that, that biggest challenge that you still have to take care of? Well, <clears throat> as it relates to, well, business is always a challenge, but um, regarding 
COVID, I think, I think the biggest challenge is still needing to constantly communicate what the symptoms are and when you should stay home. Um, whether it's um, providing that information to our employees so they know not to come to work or so that they are armed with information for their friend, you know, within their friends and family circle. Don't like, they know by now though? I mean, we've been, we've been talking about this for yeah. months. Um, is it that they don't know or is it that they feel like they need to keep coming to work? I think it's because they, I, I think there's a certain level of denial. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I kind of had a sore throat, but I didn't know what it really was. Mm -hmm. Well, we would rather you just stay home and find out than come in. And we have had, you know, some instances of that happen, um, but we really do preach it. I just think we can't control um, what people do when they're outside of, of work. And it's a, a constant reminder and just, a, a, you know, almost a pleading, please protect each other. You know, I, I've heard, I guess just among friends and acquaintances, I've heard, well, I don't care if I get it. Well, do you care if you give it to your grandma? Because it's not just about you. It's about our community. It's about our, our healthcare workers who are absolutely burnt out at this point. It's about, you know, somebody who has a stroke but can't get into a hospital and maybe uh, is permanently then debilitated or dies from it. It's, it's changing people's minds about um, not just what's important, but what your responsibility is as a, as a, as a fellow citizen. Yeah, that's a really good point. And it's a really good point too about the symptoms. I mean, we've, we've all heard of people who have come down with this. They didn't even know they had it. They had, didn't have any symptoms. Then there are yes. other people where, like you said, a little scratchy throat, a little sore throat. Um, maybe uh, they don't have a fever, but they have some of the other um, symptoms and they don't think anything of it. And so I think that's a really good point. Uh, given how prevalent it is right now, especially in Minnesota. And then um, just thinking about other people more when it comes to this as well. Uh, I had a friend who came down with it. He said, it didn't feel like much of anything. I'm fine now. And I just said, boy, it sounds like you, you did well in the, the game of Russian roulette where it's a thousand empty chambers with one bullet. And, you know, a lot of people don't end up on a ventilator, but there are a lot of people who are. Yes. And I think you've got a really good point there about, you know, you could be that one person that goes to the hospital and, and uh, that's the other part now, good luck being taken care of. Yeah, yeah. And um, really, I think, I think part of it too is caring about the people you don't know. Mm -hmm. You know, you should, you should maybe care about who you work next to. But. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And your family, but, yep. but I think it's hard for people to think about caring about somebody who lives across town. Yeah. Or or even is just passing through. I mean, we get a lot of transient uh, truck drivers coming in, and we don't want one of our employees to give it to them, and then they mm -hmm. take it into a different community, and we don't want them bringing it to us. Right. So, uh, it's it's tough. I think it's just it's. Think of our society. We've been a me society for so long. It's all about me. Well, I think we're finding out it's not all about me. It's all about us. That might be the best way to describe the number one takeaway from 2020. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. What would you say when you look back at 2020, what are your one or two uh, situations that were major challenges that you were able to solve that you're most proud of? Oh, wow. Well, one of the things, and, and I've said this several different times, is that when the pressure's on the pipes, you find out where the leaks are. And uh, one of the things that we had started to do, I, I would say, I want to go back to what I first said. You don't notice the, the leak until you find it. And so we have really looked at and are taking, you know, one by one, picking up processes. What's wrong with this process? Why is this leaking? 
So we've, we've really worked on a lot of those things. The other thing is finding out really who you can depend on um, in terms of your external resources. And one of the things that we did in the midst of all of this via Zoom and email uh, and no in-person uh, contact is that we changed our lead bank. And that was a lot of work. But we really solved um, a problem of working, having a lead bank that wanted to grow with us. And we've experienced a lot of growth and one that didn't. Mm -hmm. So uh, to me, that was solving a problem that we had that started before COVID was, was exacerbated by, by COVID. Um, but we resolved this year and it just has felt really good to have to know that we have a partner that is um, that has our back and wants to see us grow and wants to help us grow. Good, so. point. good, good uh, point about the pipes. I like that analogy. Um, any question I should have asked you today that I, I didn't? What am I doing for Christmas? Yes, what are you doing for Christmas? Staying home. Um, having a minor celebration and we're still toying with the thought of maybe driving to the cabin on Christmas Day, but chances are we'll just stay home. I live with my daughter um, and I work with her. My son works here. So we feel like we're a household. What we did on Thanksgiving was around four o'clock, got a, out a good bottle of wine and set out a few treats and that was it. And it felt really great not to have to fix a big meal and clean up afterward. Um, so we'll probably do something very much like that. Mm -hmm. Typically, this would have been a year that we would have taken a family trip together. So we, we're missing that, but um, I'm looking forward to doing it next year. You know, I keep cool. telling people it's just one year. Why can't we sacrifice for just one year? Mm -hmm. so. And we're saving money. Uh, you know, it gets back to the do-it-yourself projects. Absolutely. Yeah, I've yep. noticed that. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know, not eating out and uh, yeah. not, not going to entertainment venues and things like that. So, yeah, it's yeah. been different. I also don't know when I'm going to buy clothes again. <laughs> <laughs> well, then you, you don't have a problem that some people do, you know, the COVID-19 pounds. Well, I'm getting there. <laughs> you, can't, you can't see too much. <laughs> I know. Zoom is great, isn't it? <laughs> a lot, yes. <laughs> well, Carrie, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. I always enjoy visiting with you, Dale. Well, thank, you. thank you. I want to thank our sponsor today, the Platinum Group, which for 40 years has helped companies during turbulent times such as these. If your company needs help or you would just appreciate a second opinion, you can give them a call at 952 829 Five seven zero zero. You can learn more about Platinum Group at the website theplatinumgrp.com. Thank you to all of you for tuning in today. We'll see you next time on One Take.